Good evening and good morning, everybody. My name is Colin Peartree. Welcome to our second session of the Meet the Teams webinar series. I'm joined by my colleague, Jackie Mori, who's the technical advisor for the Avatar X Prize. And we're here with four members of Team Gitai who are out in Tokyo, Japan, actually on uh, the day later than us, which is a fun little uh, session from the future, if you will, as they are over on July 1st at this point. Before we get started with uh, Team Gitai, I just want to give a few uh, basic Zoom overviews. As you know, you're all muted for this call, but you are able to chat with us using the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We also invite you to submit questions using the Q&A uh, feature anytime throughout this call, and uh, we will be hosting a brief Q&A session toward the end of the webinar. So do come with questions and feel free to write in so that we can talk more with Gitai about the questions that you have. As you know, Gitai is one of 77 qualified teams who are working on developing this avatar technology. Uh, they are one of 14 teams that we currently have in Japan. Uh, so Japan is a very well represented group uh, in the Avatar X Prize. And as you can see from the rest of the list, this is a really large global effort to bring uh, avatar systems into existence. And we're really excited to be, uh, to be a part of this competition and to be bringing this, uh, these avatars to life. Without further ado, I want to formally uh, introduce Team Gitai to you. So I'm going to stop my share and uh, turn things over to Mr. Toyotaka Kazuki, who is going to kick us off for Team Gitai. Toyotaka? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Toyotaka, CTO of Gitai. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, this is our newest robot, Gitai G1. Uh, uh, good, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Yusuke Taguchi. I am Director of Business Development at Gitai. Nice. And um, actually, uh, you know, we categorize ourselves as a space <laughs> robotics company, but actually I'm the only one with a space background in our company. <laughs> uh, pass it on to... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, hi, I, my name is uh, Ryohei Ueda. I'm a, a software lead of Gitai. Uh, Hi, I'm Yuto Nakanish, CEO of Gitai. So, I joined the Double Fix Challenge about seven years ago. So, I'm really excited I can join the X Prize. It's a very famous robotics world competition. And just to let you know, uh, Yohei and uh, Yuto, they're, um, they're former um, uh, employees of uh, Shaft. Actually, Yuto is the founder of Shaft. Very cool. Yuto, Yohei, thank you very much. It's nice to meet you all, and Yusuke and Toyotaka as well. To let everybody know, we are going to be seeing some demonstrations from uh, G1 a little bit later in this, uh, in this session. Uh, Yuto and Ryohei are going to play a critical role in that. So you will not, this is not the last you will see of them on this call. Um, now that we've met a few of our friends from Gitai, I wanted to talk more about how Gitai came to be. Um, my understanding is that uh, you're a relatively small space startup, but you are working on some really big projects. Um, so can you tell us about your beginnings as a company and, and how it formed and what you've been working on over the last several years? Sure. Well, in um, uh, uh, July of 2016, uh, Gitai was founded. But our CEO, Sho Nakanose, um, he, from his personal experience, he wanted to provide a solution that could um, overcome the limitations of human transportation. And uh, since he, he had a personal interest in robots, he thought an avatar would be that solution. And when he was looking for uh, um, applications or our business domain, he found that uh, providing avatars here on Earth is uh, maybe a bit too costly and it might not be uh, a good business uh, opportunity. And when he focused uh, around other opportunities, he found that space was the 
domain that we should uh, concentrate in because there's already a big demand for transportation of people. For example, to the ISS, you know, one launch costs about uh, tens of millions of dollars. And having one person in space for even just one hour costs about 50,000 US dollars. So there's definitely a demand to have a more cost, a more affordable waiver. So um, after Sho decided that space is where we're gonna have to work in, he uh, decided that providing a solution that can, um, a robot that's dexterous and rigid enough to last long in space and provide um, uh, uh, provide a robot that can complete tasks that can assist or even maybe replace people in space to do certain tasks is what we should be concentrating on. And uh, that's how we came up with, um, that's how all of us uh, gathered to realize our mission. And um, you mentioned how we're working, we have some um, other projects going on, but we have, um, uh, we already have a very good relationship with the Japanese space agency, JAXA. We've had some contracts with them already. And we also have, um, we also signed a contract for collaboration with a, a space debris company. I won't say who, but, <laughs> and we're also <laughs> working very closely with uh, an automobile, uh, a global automobile company that's trying to um, develop uh, a lunar rover for human uh, for people to go on, and uh, so yeah, we have a, a couple of uh, good projects going on other than the X Prize, and yeah. we're making progress. You do. There are a number of projects that are going on. Uh, it sounds like many of them are really related to space, and I understand that that is actually kind of what's woven uh, G one into the into the picture for the Avatar X Prize. You know, when you started off, how did uh, how, how did your work change as, as you moved into the Avatar X Prize? You began really very focused on a space program. Um, sounds like most of your projects are oriented around that sense. Um, when you entered the Avatar X Prize, you know, did you did you need to shift in any way away from those projects to make sure that you were on the right track for this competition? Actually, um, so the needs in the space industry, there's various needs in the space industry, like handling small objects to big objects, many small manipulation to handling big objects. There's very wide range of uh, technical requirements in the space industry. And we're not trying to develop some robot that can work in specific domain. We want to uh, scale our robotic system to like to low earth orbit, Mar, uh, moon and beyond to Mars uh, in the future. And to do that, uh, our robotic system needs to be like really not specific, not only for specific purpose. We need, we need to develop our robot to be very general, to be very general. And uh, the goal of uh, Avatar Xprize is to develop a very general and capable robot um, that, so that really, uh, uh, match our needs. Does that make sense? So, mm -hmm. so yeah. we're developing this robot for space uh, application, but we're always uh, kind of making various experiments uh, that could uh, to make our robots um, general and capable. And I think this this our experiment uh, directly contributes to developing a, a capable avatar robot for the X Prize competition. Yeah, that's really interesting. The, the general purpose use of the of the avatar system is really important when we talk about the avatar X prize. You know, a lot of the entries, you know, we we'll, we're going to be developing use cases that will be tested against. But when you think about the possible applications of an avatar in the real world, there are a great many of them that could be done. And even when you think about how it's how it's applied in space, there are a lot of different ways that that an avatar might be used. Yeah, the ISS, for example, is a highly complicated piece of machinery that's in space. And so there are a lot of different things that the robot is going to need to be capable of. And so general purpose makes perfect sense in this case as you try to develop something that is widely applicable. So 
I have a question about the, um, you know, the differences between, you know, you want a general purpose robot, but um, is, the, is the way the robot moves, the, the navigation system, which I assume is a, a wheeled navigation system right now, is that different when you send it to space? What would you mean by a navigation system? Well, the, the movement, the mobility. Oh, mobility. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, of course, it's quite different. Like when we talk about ISS, there's no gravity. <laughs> but obviously, this is a robot for uh, making experiments on ground. What, what we currently have in mind is like uh, having a ro robot without a lower body, uh, like going from one bar to the next bar using hands and like a monkey. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're okay. thinking of mobility like that. For now. Arm mobility, not leg mobility. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we're um, imagining maybe having two, two more of these arms uh -huh. as part of the body <laughs> for uh, stabilization and mobility. Oh, interesting. So it'll almost be a torso you can grab on and move, but also have two other arms that are, are able to continue to, to, to complete tasks while it's stabilized by the other two. It's a unique uh, quad-armed type of solution that I'm not sure I, I would think of right away, um, but it would allow the robot to move around in a zero-gravity situation, wouldn't it? So imagine something like a spider. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's eight legs. So. <laughs> <laughs> Almost to the spider. Yeah. So we are getting some questions already, but I want you guys to go ahead and uh, work, finish your presentation. So some of those might get answered before uh, we get to the question period. Yeah, that's all right. I want to talk about a little bit about why Japan is sort of unique in its way of developing robots. Um, Robots in Japanese culture and society are highly prevalent. Um, you know, I'm curious of what your thoughts are on, on why this is such an important part of Japanese society and culture, and what does that do when you, or how does that impact the work that you do um, when you're creating robots? Well, actually, um, that's a very good question because, um, well, in Japan, the idea of having robots uh, as part of our daily lives or even as our friends, that, that uh, concept has been around for over 50 years. Uh, actually, the first anime in Japan uh, was called Adam or AKA Astro Boy. And uh, he was sort of, um, actually his design was based on Mighty Mouse, but um, he's a, a superhero that helps people. And um, that, so when the idea of robots were introduced to Japan, he was our friend. And uh, this is a very interesting thing, but uh, when I travel around overseas to talk with other customers, I found that this cultural difference is very different. Well, for example, when I heard, I heard that in France, um, they re uh, robots are regarded more like um, hostile things. It's not mm -hmm. as something that you would see helping you to do or helping you in everyday life or as a friend. But in Japan, mm -hmm. since that idea of uh, having robots as a uh, friend has been around for a long time. Um, it's regarded as something very familiar in our everyday lives. But on the other hand, the difficult thing about having uh, introducing robots in Japan is that since the idea has been around and that, you know, anime shows that they can do just about anything, there's a very high expectation from, um, from J Japanese um, customers that what a robot can do. So, um, you know, when you say you have a robot that's um, uh, like ours, that's uh, general purpose, and we hope it can do anything, the, the customers expect that it does do everything. And it's like, we it completely replace a person. But actually the, you know, technological level of development of robots has, is far away, still far away from that. So, you know, we still do have sometimes we face that difficulty of matching the expectation of the customer and the actual technological readiness of the robot. Right. Yeah, I can imagine that's challenging. And that, the, that idea of having that high expectation for a robot, I think, goes out beyond just the Japanese culture. I think even for myself, as I first started working on this competition, whereas had that same, a similar expectation of, 
of a robot being able to, you know, do exactly the same things that a human would be capable of with the same level of dexterity and, and even efficiency at times. So when you're working with, you know, your own designs and also working with uh, a customer or a client who is expecting a certain level, uh, what, what challenges does that present for, for your work and what kind of concessions or uh, um, compromises do you need to make in your designs? Well, actually, um, we don't, act, we don't, um, we haven't made any altercations or design changes to match uh, a specific customer need. Um, we have to um, basically, um, you know, when we talk, it's a different thing compared to talking to investors and the actual customer. Uh, the actual customer, you know, basically they're familiar with what robots can do. And uh, they're actually more surprised at the level of um, dexterity or efficiency that our robot can actually realize. It's just that we have a problem when we talk with our investors, you know, because they, they expect to see something very sexy or like a cutting edge of technology. What does Gitai have? And when, when we show that, um, we, uh, that our core competence is actually the integration uh, of all this technology into a system that actually works. Um, that's not what the you know investors are looking for. They want to see something new or sexy. Mm -hmm. so that's the difficulty that we face sometimes, but not actually with uh, the actual customers or clients. Sure. Yeah, you bring up a really great point about integration. You know, the Avatar X Prize is sort of built on that, on that where. The technology that actually we talk about most of the time, whether it's virtual reality um, principles, robotics itself, the grippers, visual systems, or, or the locomotion systems that are used, they're not all necessarily novel technologies. Many of them have been around for quite some time. And so it's interesting that you have recognized such a, a crucial part of this competition as your core competency, that being the integration side. Has that always been something that Gitai has been strong with when you've been developing your space programs or other projects? Um, yes, because uh, we believe uh, there's lots of um, technical elements inside this robot, but like even if we have one very good technology, the performance of the overall, overall robot will not raise extremely. Uh, uh, we've known that from the from experience of developing robots. But what and what we are careful of is like if we had even one bad element inside the overall system, that part will be a very uh, bottleneck in the overall system. So, uh, killing the bottleneck of overall of overall system is. Uh, crucial to developing a capable robotic system. And this will not change dependent on any projects or uh, work that we could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an important point, making sure that there are no bottlenecks so that all things can, can operate smoothly. With Gitai being a startup, uh, does, does that offer you any, um, any ease of design or any, any ways that allow you to kind of uh, make your own decisions as far as creating the best type of system? What advantages does being a, a startup offer you? Um, the advantage of developing a robot as a startup is like, um, we can select, we have, uh, we can select any kind of technology uh, freely. Like we don't, like if we are in a academia, we have to have a certain goal of developing, an, uh, we have to have some kind of development for future activity. But as a startup, we can focus on uh, a very uh, problem that uh, we can focus on uh, customers that really needs the robot now, mm. which which where we can hear actual needs from customers directly and uh, 
to be able to focus on actual needs is uh, a good point about developing robots as a startup company. Mm -hmm. And if I could add to that, um, since we're not uh, a spinoff from a certain um, research laboratory or, or anything like that, you know, we're not uh, obsessed to using this certain technology as part of our robot. We're free to use whatever we think is best for the total solution. Um, so that gives us a freedom to choose whatever we see is best for, for the best practice to achieve our goal of uh, realizing a robot system that gets the job done. That's a, that's a great point. There's a, it's almost like you've, you've eliminated two bottlenecks in that way. One of them being that you are not beholden to a certain type of technology that needs to be included in the system. And then you're also able to, to integrate those in a way that allows for a very smooth operation of the entire system, making for perhaps the more practical and usable uh, overall system. Um, I, while we're still on the note of just being a startup, before I want to answer, I want to ask, ask, pardon me, I want to ask a question from an attendee in the audience just about what it was like starting um, this robotics company in Japan. Was there a lot? Is there a lot of competition due to the high expectation of robotics? Um, was it easy to get funded? And can you compare this to other places in Japan or other places in the world? Well, um, in the, um, I, I joined at a later stage of the company, just a, a bit of a, a year ago. So uh, I don't, I'm not really familiar with how everything was in the beginning, but uh, I know that um, um, since our CEO, he wanted to, he was concentrated on hiring the best people that he could find. Um, he didn't want to make any uh, negotiations. He just wanted the best. So um, it wasn't easy to find people that matched his criteria. But now that we have a full team that has specialties in each aspect of the robot, uh, where I think we have a very, very strong team, especially on the te technology side. And um, what was the latter half of your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, well, well, maybe just answer if it is it difficult to start a company just based on the expectations of robotics being so high in Japan. Well, um, oh, that's the uh, that's another reason why Sho, our CEO, was concentrating on hiring the best. Mm -hmm. He didn't want anything in between. He wanted the absolute best um, because of what we're trying to achieve. You know, we do have lots of competition in Japan in terms of robotics, but. Um, since we're concentrated only in space and to provide a complete, uh, a total solution, not just the robot itself, but also the controls for it, even the infrastructure like uh, communications. We, our company, uh, we develop everything that's involved in realizing a robot uh, avatar system. Mm -hmm. So um, that actually differentiates us from the other competitions and especially how we're uh, concentrating only in space. We believe at this moment, we're the only company in the world that uh, has only one um, operation that's uh, concentrated only in space robotics. And how many people did you have to bring on board to make this well-rounded team with all of these different uh, technology expertise? Right now, our team is... Um, um, 12 people and uh, two part-time employees, but uh, 10 full-time. Yeah. And um, there's, uh, other than Sho and myself, everyone else is engineers. So the full-time engineers are just eight people. Mm -hmm. So you are pretty a, a small but nimble team in that. And you really clearly do have quite a well-rounded group of experts that are able to make that, that well-rounded system possible. I think the, the points that you just brought up about, um, you know, about being able to have uh, a full system with not that it's just a, a robot that you create, but also the capabilities within that, the communications, as well as the control systems. I think that's a really perfect way to move us into the demonstration of G1, if you're ready to go in that direction. So I know that the audience and I, myself included, would love to see more about what, uh, what G1 can do. So... 
with that, I'd like to turn things over so we can we can see more. Yeah, and uh, to get a to provide everyone a good view of what we'll be showing, uh, first we'll give you an overall view of uh, the whole experiment. But we also uh, prepared three other uh, two other views. One is uh, of the operator himself. Yes, this is our control system, the manipulation system of the robot that we have. We call it H1. But um, he, this is the operator who will be controlling the robot. And we also have another view uh, that the robot itself is seeing. <laughs> this is the camera view of the robot. So we be, we'll be switching between these views to give a, a good idea of how our robot works. Perfect. So while the system is getting started, can you tell us about the things that are on the on the table and what? Uh... Yeah, what's the task? So what we're trying to do is uh, uh, lifting up heavy object. Um, this is eight eight kilograms right here. About 18 pounds. And we want to show that it's not just, this robot isn't just strong, but it's also very capable of handling a small object. So to show that, uh, we're just doing a demo of opening a, a small bag. Uh, it's called, it's, this is kind of bag used in the ISS, or CTB, carbon transfer bag. And astronauts always open these, this kind of bags and take things out. Uh, so it requires really small manipulation. So we'll show this that the robot is strong and at the same time it's very capable of handling small objects. Oh, and it's, it's a soft bag too. <laughs> so it makes it another difficult thing for robots to handle. Okay, let it roll. So the robot has an eight degree of freedom arm with a gripper at the end. And uh, on the torso, it has uh, three degrees of freedom. One for going up and down, uh, making a bow and the rotation. Can the operator feel the weight of that um, eight kilogram thing? Uh, yes, we have uh, two sensors at the end of the robot. One is the six axis sensor on the wrist and three axis force sensor on the fingertip of a gripper. So, and the grip uh, operator can feel the, what's called this? And yeah. the tex texture or even Not some. Like uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we do have haptics on our roller too. I have a question coming in now while uh, while we're opening this bag about the uh, inverse kinematics of eight degrees of freedom. The question is, how do you solve the inverse kinematic? How to use them? Okay. Can can you? Uh oh. Can you hop in? And yeah. Uh, yeah, we are of course uh, using uh, inverse kinematics techniques because uh, the robot has uh, eight degrees of freedom and, and the half device has uh, six degrees of freedom and we are using some kind of technique such as uh, uh, what's it? Uh, Newton, Gaston, or Android, QP, or uh, mm. A collision check a lot of <laughs> mathematical techniques we are using. Hmm. So it, it also looks like you've got at least six Intel real senses in the head of the robot, um, at least. <laughs> why so many? So the reason why there are a lot of uh, re real senses is in order to uh, see, uh, see the 3D environment at at once. So 
uh, we also have this this uh, fish island uh, in order to uh, see the uh, see the environment at once because we don't want to move the head to ah okay. look at because yeah it has it makes a lot of latency so, from the hardware and so it's to see all around at 360 and does the operator see any of that um, 3D environment that the Intel real senses are sending back? Um, not, not, not for now. So these are based, uh, the two fisheye camera is for the operator. Okay. And the Intel real sense is for kind of like autonomy kind of application. Yeah. yeah. So the robot knows where it is. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Okay. And are you using um, uh, ROS or OS for your operating system? Yeah, we do. Okay, thank you. Those were some of the questions in the uh, Q and A. I think we're up to, up to speed. So that was that pretty was, impressive what that robot just did. <laughs> actually, we have a, a a few more demos that we'd like to show. So this was a simple combination of sim uh, elements. So what uh, what we what we have be behind us is a mock-up of the ISS keyboard module, and which mimics the uh, environment of equipment that's actually in the ISS. And we'd like to show a demo of this robot conducting several tasks. Uh, okay, I... we'll, we'll hold the questions while you do the next few demos. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, TK, while we're moving over toward this uh, this demonstration, you talked about these are some things that are uh, mimicking what you would be seeing in the ISS. How closely does this resemble what what an astronaut might find? Oh, uh, uh, two years ago, we had a, a joint research contract with JAXA and uh, been communicating a lot. And the uh, the components that we've been using in the and this experimental set setup is based on the actual uh, part numbers that is implemented in the ISS. Mm -hmm. as, as for the switches. These are very uh, common activities that the crew, the astronauts do on board the ISS, you know, flipping switches, turning knobs, uh, pulling in and out cables and things like that. Yeah. So that was the first demo, turning on and off the switches. The second one is uh, opening a Melfi. It's, it's a kind of uh, fridge that's used in the ISS. The environment in ISS is made specifically for human. And it's, it's not, the environment isn't made for robots. So it, it requires certain uh, dexterous capability of the robot. Mm -hmm. You know, we do get the question a lot, uh, are we concentrating on making humanoid robots? But actually the question answer is no. And uh, why we have G1 designed this way is because we're concentrating mostly on getting tests done in the International Space Station, which is designed for people. So as a consequence, we have to have a dual arm robot. Mm -hmm. well, the robot is in a way that would of the environment that it would uh, that it would be used in, in that sense at least. Yes. In the scenario, in the, the demonstration that we're seeing now, uh, how do the haptic systems that are in the, the grippers help uh, the, the... So currently the, we're making feedback from the three axis full sensor on the fingertip. Um, could you close up on the So uh, Can you see it here? Yeah, that's good to see the close up of the operator's hand. Yeah. So the operator is feeling the haptic sense on the and fingertips on the fingertips. 
Yeah. Is that a is that a hand device that you guys designed? Yeah, we built it from scratch. Yes, everything is we designed in in house. Massive. For the next demonstration, you're getting cut off. Yeah. Um, so the next demo is a task uh, related to the MHU mouse habitat unit. Uh, so in the ISS, there's lots of uh, uh, experiments. scientific experiments conducted on orbit. And this is one of the equipments that's actually used in the uh, ISS. And this, um, why we're demonstrating this is because this is an uh, actual demand from JAXA. Um, we heard that um, this um, running this experiment requires lots of crew time. Um, and um, once this experiment starts, uh, the majority of their time is occupied uh, by this experiment. And um, if we can, um, if they could automate this in some way, they'll be very happy. So that's why we're demonstrating how our robot is capable of actually doing some tests on this mouse habitation. Mm -hmm. When we see these, um, these blue ovals here saying left forward, uh, how are those being generated? Or is that something the operator just says, go and we see that? Or uh, is that a little autonomy? What is that? Um, so the for the control of the feet, the operator is like pushing the what, what, what pedals. 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 Okay, I wondered what this were. We're showing that through the head mount display to the uh, operator. Uh, okay. What's what you're seeing on the top left is the actual uh, actual sc screen that the operator is seeing. Gotcha. So the ovals are to show what the feet are doing. Yeah. And we've been, we've been long working on the high resolution data transfer of the visual data. And um, we have 2.4K by 2.4K um, visual feed, UOI feedback. So the operator can feel the depth of the actual environment in high resolution, which we believe we, it contributes uh, a lot in conducting various tasks efficiently. So if you didn't have enough uh, resolution in the robotic system, you wouldn't be able to see the uh, screw holes like this and be uh, attaching objects smoothly. But with high resolution visual feedback, we are able to conduct this kind of uh, task that requires very high, high accuracy. Great. I think we just answered one of the questions in the uh, Q&A. Yeah. They wanted to know the visual resolution, so. And 25 FPS. And of course, the higher resolution we have, it causes more uh, communication traffic. But we've also developed um, um, a way to transfer such information in less than... Uh, 70, 70 milliseconds with our internal latency. Good. And we, we also don't have an actual physical net, so the operator will be able to, uh, will have very little VR, what do you call that? VR, um, it doesn't get a VR sick. <laughs> uh, or whatever. Yeah. No sim sickness. Uh -huh. uh, and latency will do that to you. And, and what is this task that he's doing? He's trying to take something out and so uh, this is a mock of uh, experimental equipment to compare uh -huh. like 1G and 0G environment. So this goes into that equipment and when it, when it, if it rotates, it causes 1G inside the equipment. Well, where it doesn't, when it doesn't rotate, there'll be 0G. Yeah, it's, it's actually a, a cage unit that um, holds the mice inside. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, um, you know, in the JAXA experiment, they provide uh, uh, an environment where a mice, one mice experiences zero G, and another experiences one G, 
and they see the difference how um, the, 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 the mice feels different uh, according to the different types of background. I don't suppose the G1 is capable of handling a mouse, but it would be able to. <laughs> it will be able to assist that kind of operation yeah. a lot. Well, actually, you uh, brought up a good point. Um, you know, we did show how it's capable of lifting heavy objects and it has power. But, you know, at the same time, we'd like to have the robot be able to handle soft and um, um, rock objects, maybe like even a mouse. So uh, we didn't prepare it today, but we also showed a demonstration once. We recorded a demonstration from us where we lifted the same um, this uh, dumbbell, but at the same time lifted up a, a potato chip. Oh wow! Yeah, With that's great, of course. <laughs> yeah, a drastic difference in weight in that sense. Is the haptic system that's in the gripper able to detect something of that weight and that texture? Does it need require something of heft to? To, to allow it. As for the texture, we haven't been working on uh, actually expressing that kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. if, if it's required in some kind of market, we will certainly work on sure. trying to do that. But it's mostly the operator who has to, through the visual system uh, and the haptics, decide whether an object's fragile or, or very sturdy. Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we've done a demo using G1, but we're also working on, uh, so it doesn't have to be this size drill arm robot in the ISS. So what we're working on is uh, making a robot specifically uh, for the purpose of this task. Like this one is a minimum setup for uh, conducting same experiments. Mm -hmm. So that's just the, base, the, the the necessity, the one necessary arm that would be required to complete a lot of these tasks. Yeah. How many, uh, I want to look at, at G1 again, because I know it's going to be the robot that mostly is your, what you're focusing on for the Avatar XPRIZE. How many iterations has it gone through to get to the stage it's at now of, of the look, the size, the way that it moves, vision systems? Um, this is the... As a company, it's about seventh uh, generation robot. But uh, previously, we've been developing uh, uh, robots of a smaller size mm -hmm. to actual uh, that's shown here, which had been a very uh, prototype, yeah. very initial prototype here. Yeah. Very small. It's one of our first uh, yeah, prototypes. But uh, from the sixth generation development, we've been making a human-sized robot. And uh, counting from the sixth generation, this is the this this guy's the third generation, uh, uh, third in terms of uh, human size. So since the XPRIZE started, this is the third generation robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you're talking about using this robot in a in the ISS, which is you know a delicate to say the least environment, you know, things need to be done correctly. So when you talk about your design, how do you work safety and uh, into your, into your um, considerations? So uh, if we are sending robots to the ISS, uh, it cannot harm the environment and it cannot harm the crew. So mm -hmm. what we're doing is uh, some kind, we're applying uh, some control so that the robot, robot can act uh, to the environment or the human very softly, to be uh, very soft against external force. Mm -hmm. And we've been working on that kind of control too, to mm. for the safety. Yeah, that's a really crucial element. You know, when you, if you accidentally bump into something or a human is, is too close to it, you want to have that that ability to be soft, as it were. I know that the the object itself is quite hard, um, you know, but in that in that environment, things there are a lot of things that are crucial to ask. So that's important to to consider. Um, an easy question: How much does does G one weigh? A single arm itself is like um, 14, 13, 14 kilograms. So mm -hmm. your upper half of the body will be less than 50 kilograms, less than 100 pounds, I guess. 
you know, we're so, making the lower part heavy <laughs> yeah. so that it doesn't fall over and tip over. Sure. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. And so it would be even more lightweight, you know, when it's you know, when it's baseless, say on the ISS, um, you may add another arm into the equation so that it has a little bit of stability, as we mentioned, more mobility. Um, yeah, but actually, um, weight yeah. is a, a very difficult hurdle that we have to face when we send something to space because we're actually charged per kilo. Mm. And um, of course, you know, we don't have uh, endless capability of sending things up to space. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to, that's also, that's a technical uh, limitation that we always have to face when we try to send something to space. And when you send this robot to space, is the operator still on the Earth or are they somewhere else in the space station? Um, when we're sending robots inside the ISS, we assume the operators are on Earth. But for example, if we're sending robots to Moon, we can have a, there will be an uh, satellite orbiting around the moon, so the operator can be in space and uh, controlling the robot on moon from space. Mm -hmm. well, well, that's a lonely job. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you know, the farther we get, uh, the, the distance between the operator and the robot gets further and further. Of course, we have to face a, a physical you know, challenge about latency. Yep. So. Uh, when we start sending robots uh, to the moon or even further to Mars, uh, we can't avoid that. So we're we'll, we'll definitely providing a robot that has that's hot, half autonomous, half remote controlled. But we will always leave some space for human recognition to intervene in the operation of the robot itself. Right. So there'd be some AI predictive planning, that type of thing. Do you have plans soon to send G1 or any of your projects to the ISS? Do any of the projects that you have working with JAXA, for example, have that coming soon? Um, so we have a couple of missions. Uh, the ex experiment of this uh, MHU is something that we're working with JAXA. But uh, as for the other experiments, we're planning to launch our robotic arm to ISS somewhere next year. Uh, this is the experimental setup that we are planning to send to the uh, ISS. Mm -hmm. And we're currently uh, hoping to launch next May, May of 2021. And do you have to go through a lot of safety checks on Earth before you can send this up to the space station? Because I know, you know, they're pretty risk averse up there. Yeah, we, we've already started, uh, we've already got a contract to launch to the ISS and we've already started the safety review with the NASA folks. Uh, we've already passed the phase zero phase safety review and we're preparing to go to the next phase. So we're always, we're not just developing things that work on Earth, we're like changing the materials, changing the circuits so that it, we can prove that it's safe in the space industry too. Well, actually, you raise a very good question because one of the very, very difficult things that we have to face when sending things up to space is the safety review, uh, especially on the International Space Station because, you know, people are there all the time. We have to make sure that it doesn't harm the environment plus the people um, in the environment. So, um, yeah, the safety review, that's actually one of the biggest hurdles that we have to clear when you're trying to send something up to space. Yeah. yeah, and you can't really test it for zero G, like uh, uh, if, if this thing was floating around and it's gonna bump into somebody, there's, it's kind of hard to test without the same uh, situation here on Earth. Exactly, um, there, there's some things that we can test, but um, not exactly the same environment. So we yeah. have to work on, um, feedback or experience from people who have been to this space station, of course, and the astronauts. Do you plan to put a lot of Velcro on it so they can go to some of the Velcro pads to stabilize it when it's on the ISS? Well, we'll, we'll um, secure it with um, screws and things like that, yeah. Well, I can uh, see your monkey kind of arm thing, you know, going to, from the Velcro to Velcro. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't gone up to that um, 
stage yet. We're just gonna have uh, one single arm that's gonna work on, uh, yeah, that's gonna show some demonstrations of the capabilities that it can do. Mm -hmm. Just like you see here. Yeah. This is actually very close to the um, actual configuration that we'll have on the ISS. So we'll conduct experiments of turning on and off the switches by autonomous operation. And at the same time, we're, going, we're planning to do that with the remote control. So, and also we're, kind of, we're planning to conduct some uh, in-space assembly tasks to con construct uh, uh, a structure in space. So that would require it being out in the vacuum of space. So all, are all of, your, um, all of your robots and robotic arms capable of operating outside of the ISS out in the vacuum of space? As for this project, uh, we're only going to conduct the experiment inside the uh, mm -hmm. ISS, Station. Not, not, not outside. Got it. And um, in our next experiment, we're hoping to conduct in 2022 or 2023, we'll go outside in the space environment. So you're working toward that. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's some wide operating conditions there. <laughs> I'm curious about the operation of G1. Um, for as far as being inside of that system, being an operator, maybe I'm wondering if either of you, or maybe it's just uh, Ryohei who has spent the most time in that system, but did it take a long time to get used to? Um, is it pretty natural jumping into that cockpit to operate it? Actually, the new cockpit that we've been developing is quite new. Uh, we finished mm -hmm. building that like a month ago. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. The operator hasn't been able to train a lot, but uh, it's kind of getting more and more intuitive in controlling the device now. Yeah. I think it's because of the sensory feedback and the high resolution visual data that we are sending to the operator. But of course, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to achieve the level that our operator has right now, it will take some time to get used to, to the controls. But uh, we don't expect something like a year or something. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, and as in anything, you know, learning a new control system in any sense is it will present its own challenges. You need to get acclimated to a system, but you feel like yours is something that's a little bit more natural um, that somebody could easily or more easily uh, jump into. And so that, you know, that thing also, what I'm noticing is that it's relatively simplistic. I obviously understand that the actual uh, operations of it require some complex connections, but the look of it just being two arms um, with a seat in front of it, and I believe some pedals down below, um, how portable is the system? Um, portable? Hmm. We haven't thought of that. <laughs> but, but our, our remote control device requires like two kinds of OS, one's for the Ubuntu that's running ROS on one side and we're using Windows system to control the uh, app, uh, head mount display, so two desktops and uh, uh, our, the weight of our haptic device is around 20 to 30 kilos, so maybe two suitcases <laughs> would be enough to uh, carry the whole device. So, I mean, all things considered, that is actually fairly portable. You know, the weight is not, in, you know, too much of an encumbrance, but um, maybe something to think, to continue to think about. <laughs> not yeah, to we don't want to build something that can only be used in our office. We want to develop something that can actually go into the market. So it has to be some, it, we have that kind of certain extent of, uh, you know, yeah. But mm -hmm. it, we, we want to build something that we can actually take out anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're, we're running up on the, uh on the hour mark for our conversation here. So I'm gonna to begin to wrap things up, but I have a question that I'm curious about. Um, you know, you have, you've you been doing a lot of work um, separate from the Avatar XPRIZE. Katai has been around since, you know, before the inception of this competition. Um, 
but thinking just about the Avatar X Prize, aside from perhaps winning the grand prize or some part of it, how would you describe success for your team or for your system uh, at the conclusion of the competition? Mm, well, um, one of the main reasons that we decided to participate is because the attention that we get so if we win the whole thing, or even just staying in the final round. Mm. You know, we saw the example of how um, companies acquired attention during the lunar lunar experiments, yeah. and that was very, very uh, tempting for us because you know we're very still a very small company, very few people know about us. But um, the attention that we can get if we can at least go to the final round, uh, that's something that it's very. Uh, we're looking forward to very much. Mm -hmm. as, a, as, as a technical side, we, we don't want to develop a robot that can only pick one thing. We want, I, I want to develop something that can be very general. So uh, to keep making experiments, handling general objects, X-Prize competition is a very uh, good tech, uh, is kind of a good mo motivation for us to conduct various uh, experiments. Yeah, well, that's great. happy to be your motivation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and we are uh, obviously excited to see more about, you know, more from G1, more from Gitai, and uh, to be able to see more of what comes out of uh, this project for you guys. This has been an incredible demo just to see all the capabilities and, and the amazing work you put into creating G1 and the other projects that, that you've demonstrated today. We commend you for your efforts up to this point and wish you the best on what's to come. Um, any parting words from, uh, from your team as we, as we wrap up at the top of the hour? Top up. Uh, hope, hope everyone enjoyed our tour. We're, <laughs> we're kind of really interested in seeing how other teams are going to attend the express competition and Hope to see you soon in the next uh, semifinals. And uh, we'll keep um, developing our robot and uh, introducing more videos of uh, our capabilities. Uh -oh. So keep, keep, uh, please keep an eye on for us. Check our webpage, <laughs> website. <laughs> we look forward to that. Kudos today. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you guys, hope everyone enjoyed. We will. <laughs> we'll very much be looking <laughs> to seeing more from your team, um, more videos, and we'll be on the lookout. For all of the competing teams who are also watching, uh, be on the lookout for more from, from Gitai. Um, it's sure to be uh, some really interesting developments as we go forward. So we are out of time today for this session. On behalf of Avatar XPRIZE, XPRIZE at large, and uh, the rest of my team, I'd like to thank Toyotaka, Yuto, Ryote, Ryohei, and Yusuke for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, for those of you who have joined us live, we thank you for your time as well. And if you're viewing this recording, uh, so a hello from the past here. Uh, it has been a pleasure speaking with you, Gitai, and uh, letting the audience see a closer look at you and G1. If you want to learn more, uh, visit Gitai's website at gitai.tech. That's G-I-T-A-I dot tech, T-E-C-H. You can check out more about what they're doing in the future. If you have questions for the Avatar X Prize, feel free to uh, email us at avatar at xprize.org and um, be on the lookout for more from us as well. So as you know, we're creating, we've created this series to highlight our, uh, our competing teams. The next Meet the Teams interview is expected to be in mid-July and we'll be speaking with Team Santa Ana from Italy. And uh, we are really excited for that one as well. So be on the lookout for more webinar information soon and mark your calendars. So until then, we are wishing you well from Los Angeles and uh, Hope that you're all staying healthy and well. We hope that you enjoy the rest of your afternoons, evenings, and mornings for those of you who are coming from Tokyo or elsewhere in the world. And uh, we wish you well. Take care, everybody.